Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm joined on the podcast today by Holly Goldberg Sloan, author of the new novel, Pieces of Blue. New York Times bestselling writer Meg Wolitzer wrote about the novel. Pieces of Blue is as propulsive as it is observant and atmospheric. Sloan understands her characters deeply and makes us need to know what happens to them. In fact, a lot happens to them, and we want to know it all. This novel is a family story, a love story, and a mystery. I couldn't put it down. Holly, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me today. Absolutely. Well, if someone hasn't yet heard about your new novel, Pieces of Blue, how would you describe the novel? I'm going to start by saying that's such a hard question for me because <laughs> the book presents itself in the beginning to be one thing, uh, and, and perhaps it's not completely that thing, meaning we start out by discovering that there's a family, they've the husband has died swimming in the ocean, and life insurance has finally come through, and the, and the wife, the mother... Uh, with three children, somewhat impulsively buys a piece of property in Hawaii, a motel, and takes her kids and moves to the North Shore of Hawaii. And it appears to be, perhaps in the beginning, simply about starting over, simply about grief. But uh, I, I always write, I try to write situations in a hum in a humorous way. So while I'm talking about grief, as I did in a book I wrote for young people called Counting of Blue, uh, count, uh, Counting by Sevens, I, I'm, ho I'm hoping that I get serious and comedic at the same time. And yet there is something else going on in the book, and I, I don't want to give any of that away. But it, sure. has, it has kind of a propulsive um, forward momentum is how I would describe it. Sure. Well, do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to writing Pieces of Blue? Yes. And I've been working on it for a long time. I am an established writer of young adult and middle grade fiction, and I am an established screenwriter. I wrote the movies uh, Angels in the Outfield and um, the Crocodile Hunter movie, Made in America, The Big Green. I, I, I have a position in family entertainment. And so I started this book, I think it was eight years ago, which is crazy now when I think about it, but <laughs> I, I started it and I stopped it and I started and I, I wasn't sure what I was writing. That's very often the case with my work. I, I don't outline so much as I think of characters and putting characters in situations of conflict. So the, the first thing that started me about writing the book was I was on location for a film in Australia and we were in the van, part of the crew. And when you make movies, you're always in vans with people and it feels like you're always driving to location, back from location, <laughs> scouting, we were driving. So we're in the van and it's there's something about being in cars that can be intimate, even with people that you aren't necessarily at the time that close to. So I would say cars lead to secrets in a way. And one of the producers told us that his father died when he was young. Now, in my mind, I thought he was around 12. I recently spoke to him and he said, no, I think I was I don't think I said that I was 15, but anyway, my <laughs> mind, I guess my age, everyone down. It seemed more tragic if he was 12. It's tragic anyway, but he died suddenly. And he said he lived in the Pacific Northwest and I grew up, uh, well, we moved a lot of places, but I tell everyone Eugene, Oregon, because that's what I think of as home. And so he said that his mother took, had the insurance money from life insurance money and she had a choice to make. And her choice was, she found an old rundown motel in Hawaii, and then there was a salmon fishing boat. She knew nothing about salmon fishing, and she not, knew nothing about running motels. And, and the long and the short of that was she wanted the motel, the kids all wanted the motel, and her family talked her into the salmon fishing boat. So we're in the van, and he said, 
for five years, the family ran a charter salmon fishing business, which they knew nothing about. And in the end, they sold the boat and they made no money. And there are many stories about the boat. But he said, what would have happened if we'd gone to Hawaii? I would have grown up in Hawaii. And I love Hawaii and I have a lot of connections to Hawaii. And I couldn't stop thinking about, well, what would have happened if his mom had taken them and gone to Hawaii? So that that was really the start of it. And the first thing I started writing was about a woman who takes her children and goes to Hawaii. That's great. Has the person who was sitting in the van and told you that story, has he read the novel yet? He has. He was quite surprised. (laughs) (laughs) Quite surprised with what I did with that, uh, with that notion. I mean, he's very supportive. He's a friend. He lives in Houston, Texas, and I'm going to go on book tour. And uh, one of my cities is Houston and he's going to be there. I'm pretty thrilled about that. Uh, I think it's interesting that for me, because I write contemporary realistic fiction, I don't make up dragons or vampires. I I write about the world around me. And so anyone who ends up talking to me um, maybe somewhat exposes themselves to the fact that I could (laughs) take this an idea and go crazy. But um, there there is a serious side to it as well. My first husband, we were divorced, but He was such a close friend and we had two children together and we raised those kids together. I'm remarried and my first husband lived only a few blocks away. So the kids would walk back and forth between our houses and he died. Um, He had heart failure swimming in the ocean. And so I, uh, I think I take things I took this idea of a woman starting over. I took some of the loss and and uh, the emotions that go behind suddenly a person is alive one day and they're not alive the next. Right. And, um, and I put that in the book as well. And then I love children. I love kids. I love writing about children and the relationship between parents and kids. That's one of the things that, um, and, and perhaps why I've written so many either family movies or books that involve families. And this is my first a book that's for adult readers. I tell people, oh, I've written an adult book. And some people think that's a pornographic thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I say, no, no, it's for, so I'm learning, I'm learning <laughs> how to speak about it. And so I have to say, I have written my first book, Pieces of Blue, for adult readers. <laughs> well, well, as you mentioned earlier, in addition to, to writing novels, you've also written screenplays and you directed a movie for Disney in the 90s, The Big Green, and your young adult novel, Counting by Sevens, published in 2013, has gone on to sell more than a million copies. What led you from screenplays and movies and directing into writing novels? I'm going to say I seem to be swimming the wrong direction at all times. Most <laughs> people start by writing stories and novels, and then they go into film and television. I've been in the Writers Guild uh, since I was 24 years old. I have worked in film and television most of my whole career. The, I would say one of the things that moved me towards writing novels and fiction that was on the page versus on the screen was the fact that the kind of movies they make today have changed significantly from the 90s early 2000s they we we moved as an industry towards superhero movies and big tentpole movies and smaller movies more human stories would likely not be made today and and movies that have huge places in our cultural uh, history and in our psyche. Movies such as Kramer versus Kramer or even a movie that has Tom Cruise, Rain Man. Would they make that today? Because it's really the story about two brothers. Those are the, I'm interested in those kind of stories. Sure, sure. But they seem to have migrated somewhat to television or streamers. And so a way for me to, to keep telling those kind of stories 
was to write them first as a book. And of course, ironically, my books are optioned now to be made into <laughs> the film and television. So, uh, so maybe I've come full circle in that regard. But they are very different in the sense that when you make a movie or you make a television show, I've, I've done all those things. I've directed uh, three movies and I, I've written for television. It's an intensely collaborative effort. So you have actors, you have a um, hundred people to get something going and you stand there together as a team. Even when you're a director, I was the first woman to direct a live action film for Walt Disney. So with the big green, which is a soccer film. And uh, that requires many people and, and organizing and, and motivating and, and mobilizing them all towards this common goal, which is telling a story. Well, the exact opposite of that is sitting in your room. I'm right now sitting on my bed. I live in Santa Monica and I, uh, and I have my computer in front of me and it's just me with two rescue dogs and my husband's in the kitchen. That's a very small personal experience, but it's an experience that you control in a different way. And you wake, for me, I wake up in the morning thinking about my characters. I take a walk thinking about my characters and their situations. I'm not managing people and circumstance. I'm managing my psyche. And it's a different thing. I was really pleased to see to read something online that was talking about professions. And it said, what professions and careers, but what what's out there where as you age, it might be harder to be that person because of the changes that people go through and when they go through life. And it said shockingly that the, uh, the high point of being a mathematician was when you were 31. Apparently that's when your brain is firing um, and I'm going to say, if I took my math SAT right now, I, who knows what I would do? And I was pretty good at math, but um, so it's been downhill for me. But there are some things, and there are certain kinds of medicine where you peak after you're around 50, your hands shake, whatever it is. But it said when you were a novelist, it only got better. <laughs> <laughs> you only had more experience to draw from. You only had more life circumstance. You'd only met more people. You were maybe more articulate. I'm so glad because I'm 64 years old and I've just wrote my first novel for adult readers. Um, I hope that's encouraging to some people. I hope <laughs> that they see that and think the great part, you can't go out and do a movie by yourself. Maybe you could shoot it in your yard, but it's not really the way it's done. But you can at any age decide you want to tell a story and, and write a novel. So I... I find that to be one of the things about the process that's pretty invigorating and pretty wonderful. That's great. You said that you were in the Writers Guild when you were in your early 20s. What did get you into movies and TV to begin with? I mean, you said you moved around a lot. What what kind of was the the motivation or what was your how did you get into that initially? I always loved movies. Maybe movies were more important when I was growing up, they were such a big thing to me. And I, I loved watching the Academy Award. I loved everything about them, movie stars, everything. And I went to college in Boston, but I did one year at Dartmouth and they had a film program. Wellesley at that time didn't have any film classes. And I met a small group of, of young people that were interested in film. And then I moved to New York and I moved with my boyfriend at the time when we graduated, we moved to California and I loved movies and I wanted to try to write a screenplay. And my story is not typical in the sense that <laughs> I wrote a screenplay, my first screenplay, and I optioned it to Paramount. Um, wow. I was 24 and I, I've been, that's why I've been in the guild so long. I got an agent right away. I, it was a combination of good luck and uh, maybe some sort of intuitive understanding of story. I had won the senior writing award at Wellesley. I graduated from Wellesley, and I mm -hmm. and I always loved reading and I always loved stories. And I think we, if you've watched enough film and television, I grew up 
as I said, in Eugene, Oregon, uh, in large part, it rained all the time. And I just remember my parents and the friends, my friend's parents telling us to turn off the television, turn off the television. But it was pouring rain outside. So what were we supposed <laughs> to do? So we would just sneak back in and turn the television on very low and then get very close to the television um, so that we would have been yelled at. But I, And we also read a lot of books. And we went to the library every Saturday and we took the bus, my two best friends, and we bring the books home. And those characters, the people, the situations, it was so alive to me. But I think this other fundamental thing happened in my childhood, which was in fifth grade, I had a teacher who I think there was something personally going on in her life. But about a month into school, the school year, she started locking the door of our classroom and just reading us books all day. We didn't do any of the regular classwork. <laughs> we didn't do any math. We didn't do any science. We, she would take these books and, and we would all move our chairs up front and she would sit on a stool and read to us. It was pure magic to have an adult read to us for hours on end. And after about three weeks, I guess somebody must have told. She said not to say anything. <laughs> she said, this is our little secret. And um, then we went to school one morning and she was no longer there. And the principal was in our, he was in our classroom and he asked us a lot of questions. What have you been doing? And slowly we all had to say, well, all those books that are up there on her desk, we've read all those. We've listened to all those for the last three weeks, four weeks. And my mind, who even knows? Everyone's such an unreliable narrator about their past. <laughs> no, it was a week or five months. I don't know. Right. We, we never saw her again. And yet she completely changed my life because I loved listening to her read. And that's why I like audiobooks so much as well, because maybe I go back to having that teacher read. Sure. And when you're struggling with your mental health, the world can seem pretty heavy, like no one understands what you're feeling or you're not sure how to ask for help. But here's the real truth. You're never in this alone. 988 Lifelines trained crisis counselors are available 24-7 to offer the help and support you need to make it through. No judgment, no stigma, just someone to listen. Text or call 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, day or night, 988. Hope has a new number. It's Jeep 4x4 season. Make your next adventure epic and hurry in now for great deals. Now while qualified lessees get a low mileage lease on the 2023 Jeep Grand Cherokee Laredo 4x4 for $4.89 a month for 24 months with $3,809 due at signing. Tax title license extra. No security deposit required. Call 1-888-925-JEEP for details. Requires dealer contribution at least through Ally Financial. Extra charge for miles over 20000 Residency restrictions apply. Take delivery by 531-23. Jeep is a registered trademark. My mind could wander, but at the same time, I was so focused. So, well, well, I know that screenplays tend to be a very structured form. What was your writing process when you're when you're working on pieces of blue and when you're working on a young adult novel with with, you know, uh, fiction on the page? Are you someone who outlines and plots extensively before you start writing? I don't do that. Uh, it is absolutely the case what you just said, that there's a difference between writing for television or very specific number of minutes have to be in each episode, a half hour, one hour. And film, which is a little more forgiving, films can be different lengths, but they have structure and they have craft involved in that structure so that you have to have, or you inherently know that you're about 10 minutes into the film and something needs to have happened. There has to be um, an incident that propels it forward. And when you write television, there are usually act structures that used to be dependent upon where they were placing commercials. Now with streaming, that's not as much the case, but because they sell uh, intellectual property all around the world, you still somewhat build in those breaks because they may have commercials if they where they're showing it overseas. So you have really fine sense of how the thing is put together. And I, maybe that's what I like best about novels is the liberation I have that I don't have to have a first <laughs> act break that leads me into the second act. 
Maybe I'm intuitively still doing it because I don't know that I'm doing it. Probably that's the case, but it's just not as regimented. Um, so it's a different kind of writing. And it's one thing I love about writing books is the kind of freedom I have. And I, I, I don't outline, but I usually know the ending because to me, the analogy is I'm going to drive a car and I've done mm -hmm. this many times. I'm going to drive from LA to New York. There are so many ways for me to get to New York. I can go the Southern way, the Northern way. I can double back. I can, and that's much more what it is to write a novel. If you know where you need to end up, then you can take the journey. What's hard is if you don't know where you're going. So I, when people are writing books or telling stories, I tell them, I think it's important to try to figure out where you want to be with the people in the end, and then you can write towards it or to it. So I don't make outlines meticulous. I don't do that, but everybody has their own way. Just sure. If, if I was giving everybody a chicken to cook, everyone would have their idea of how to cook that <laughs> chicken. What's important is that you cook it. So what's important is that you actually do it versus planning on doing it. I, sure. With anything, what's important is getting it in the oven and, and getting it going. So um, <laughs> Very I, true. I, I, I've spent my life uh, trying to be the person that moves forward. I, and that, that's helped me as a novelist. That's great. Well, what writing advice would you offer for those who might be working on their own screenplays or stories or novels? I guess the main advice I try to give people is encouragement, is the notion that one of the wonderful things about doing something that is a creative endeavor is there is no right, there is no wrong. Um, I also think when you start your story, that may not be later how your story actually starts. So what I'm saying in film, we can cut things up and move them very easily. Mm -hmm. But now because of technology, you can do the same thing in books. So I, I often tell kids that in Charlotte's Web, the first line of the novel is, where's Papa going with the ax? That's a pretty provocative line for a child <laughs> to read. Where is he going with the ax? It's yeah. alarming. Uh, and that's how she goes to save the little pig. Uh, but that wasn't how E.B. White, who's a hero, that wasn't how he started that book. He started that book with what is now, I think, currently maybe chapter three, which talks about the farm. And his editor, and that's why editors are so important, and and that's why let, allowing friends to look at your work and, and give you not necessarily the specifics of what to do, but an overall feeling of if it's working. So you can take something that is deeper into your writing and make that be the start of the story. So that's what that's my big encouragement to people is go ahead and start writing, but it's all about rewriting anyway. So if you know you're going to do it again many times in order to get it right, whatever right even is, then that allows you the freedom to not be so precious with every word, with every sentence, with every thought, with every notion, because you're going to try to find it while you're doing it. And that kind of freedom that comes from knowing, all right, today... I'm just going to see what happens if I do this in my work, if the character goes in this direction. I, that That's what allows you really, I think, to get, have a beginning, middle, and end and to come up with something that is is cohesive in, on some level and that you want to share. I mean, ultimately, if you're writing and you don't want to share, then you're writing a diary. But if you're writing and you do want to share it, then you're looking for something in the characters or the circumstance that has something, some commonality in it that has some relatability to it. Uh, at least that's what I try to do with my work. Sure. Well, are you working on a new novel now? I am doing another book for young people because uh, I have an ongoing contract with 
my publisher for, for that. And then afterwards, and I'm also writing, I just finished a Hallmark movie that I wrote with my son, which that was fantastic. Calvin Sloan is my son. And we decided to do a project together and we sold that to Hallmark. So I haven't left uh, film and television behind. And then I'm working with some friends in Europe uh, to do a film in Amsterdam. And that's really exciting. It's an adult, uh, a movie for adult viewers. I have to say <laughs> it right. Otherwise it sounds like I'm doing some thing. Um, I'm doing that. And, uh, and I will then write another novel, um, that is more geared towards adults, I think as well. That's great. Well, what novels have you read recently that you enjoyed? I just read a book that I loved so much. It wasn't a novel. It's an interesting book. It's kind of a hybrid of, it's called also a poet by Ada Calhoun. Uh, there was a, it's, a wonderful book about Frank O'Hara, about Peter Sheldahl, about growing up in New York, um, about literary criticism, about St. Mark's plays. It's I, I'm mesmerized by that book. I really, really enjoyed it. I'm in a group uh, of fellow novelists. And we meet once a week over Zoom. We started during COVID. And uh, there are a few people in the group that one's a television writer and one's a television producer, but we're all, we're all really doing the same thing. And we met during COVID in order to have a sense of community. Sure. And we started reading and we read a book almost a week. So- wow. We're sometimes we take two weeks on a book, <laughs> but it's pretty crazy. So the things that, and sometimes we read uh, from the past. We we were reading some Edith Wharton, and then we read we read fiction as well as nonfiction. And uh, what's the next, coming up? We're going to be reading, and then if we read something that has poetry in it, we also then study the poetry. Uh, but I, we've read some wonderful books in the last three years, and and we're all writing books at the same time. So that makes the experience even more layered because um, we're able to bring in part of our own life into it. That's great. Well, where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you and your novels and your your movies and TV, et cetera? Well, I do have a website, hollygoldbergsloan.com. And I will be, um, in the next week, I will be in Boston and Cambridge um, and speaking at Wellesley College also. And then I'll go to New York and I go to Houston and Seattle and Portland, Nashville. Um, I'm on tour for Pieces of Blue. I'm really proud of the fact that it was an Oprah Spring book pick. And, uh, and I'm excited that my publishing date is May 9th. So it's all coming up for me very quickly. It seems as if you wait and wait, and then all of a sudden it's there right before you. <laughs> kind of like having a baby, you're pregnant, and all you want <laughs> to do is just not, at some point you're just done, and there are months left to go. And then when you're driving to the hospital, you say, oh my gosh, this all happened so quickly. What's happening? That's the mood I'm in right now. Oh my gosh, it's Thursday and I'm publishing on Tuesday, May 9th. It's all in front of me. What's happened? <laughs> Even though it's been years, <laughs> it's been years. I don't know, time, it collapses, it expands. What is time? I have no idea. <laughs> this little neighbor kid said time is art. And I'm not even sure what she meant, but I'm going to go with it. Time is art. <laughs> That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking to Holly Goldberg Sloan, author of the new novel, Pieces of Blue. The novel is available May 9th, so go buy, buy a copy. And Holly, thanks for doing this interview. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you su for supporting authors and books and the world of literacy. It means a lot, Jeff. Wonderful. The family stepped through the double glass doors into the open-air concourse of the Daniel K. Inouye International Airport, 
and the clouds overhead exploded with rain. The dripping palm fronds bobbed in the humid breeze as the foursome walked under the portico to the baggage collection area. Lindsay put her arm around Senna, her younger daughter. The little girl's expression was tense, and the look on Lindsay's face was equally strained. Lindsay took in a deep breath, telling her kids, It's raining, just like at home. Olivia, the oldest, corrected her mother. Hawaii is home now. At the baggage carousel, friends and family carrying colorful lays greeted the arriving passengers. Soon, more than half of the people on their flight had wreaths of flowers hanging around their necks. Lindsay impulsively reached for her wallet. Come on, kids. She headed toward an older man in a brightly printed shirt seated on a three-legged stool. Behind him was a glass-doored refrigerator filled with garlands of plumeria, tuberose, carnations, orchids, and mylay leaves. Lindsay could hear the suitcases starting down the chute as she lifted her phone and took her first photo in Hawaii. Her children, draped in their newly purchased wreaths of expensive fuchsia-colored orchids, were all smiling. She hadn't seen that in a long time. Then Senna's smile dissolved. Mama, you don't have a flower necklace. I don't need one, sweetheart. Senna lifted her lay over her head. Here, we can take turns. Carlos seemed eager to get rid of his orchids. No, really, have mine. Senna stepped back. Don't fight. Olivia answered as if taking a bite out of her sister. Who's fighting? And suddenly the spell was broken. Fatigue, disappointment, and heartbreak were back. Lindsay started toward the baggage carousel, angry at herself for spending nearly $100 on the flowery strings. It felt like a real tourist move. They were going to be living here now. She turned around, hoping to reset, only to see the kids were gone. For the briefest moment, her adrenaline surged. Then she spun in the other direction and discovered her children talking to the flower salesman. They appeared to be cutting some kind of deal. In seconds, her daughters and son were back at her side, their expensive orchid lays gone. Around the kids' necks were bright blue carnations. A fourth string of the dyed flowers was in Senna's outstretched hands. We traded, Mama, so you got one too. Lindsay kissed the top of Senna's head and slipped the electric blue lay around her neck, always startled at how easy it was as a parent to go from fiery frustration to affection. She worked hard to keep it together as she mumbled, thank you, sweetheart, and then pulled her kids together in a hug so tight that Olivia yelped, Mom, you're hurting my ear. Their bags dribbled out as if they had been separated in the cargo hold to cause maximum irritation. Olivia's suitcase was the very last one to hit the carousel. In the 26 months since their family tragedy, they had whittled down their possessions until each had only a carry-on, a backpack, and a Costco Kirkland Traveler's Choice, a 30-inch piece of luggage with spinner wheels. Starting over, Lindsay kept repeating, meant making hard choices and leaving the material past behind. Carlos took charge of commandeering a cart for the luggage. Senna insisted on still pulling her carry-on. It wasn't until they were in the small bus heading to the cheapest car rental agency available online, the one two miles from the airport's central ring, that Lindsay realized her youngest child had been quiet for 30 minutes. Senna alternated from being the most talkative of the three kids to the mute observer, and both states came with red flags. But at least Olivia, 14 going on 24, looked steady as she scrolled through pictures on her phone. The girls, separated in age by seven years, were so different. Lindsay could gaze at each of her children and see something of herself, but only if she did so with a penetrating stare. Teenage Olivia had a long neck and an oval face that might appear severe, but at the right angle could be as classic as a Renaissance marble sculpture. She had straight brown hair and muddy eyes that in low light seemed flecked with gold. Seven-year-old Senna had a round face and a head of curls inherited from her father's side of the equation. Carlos, only two years younger than Olivia, completed the exercise in the variable nature of genetics, he had copper-colored hair, blue eyes, and skin so pale his medical chart read ultra-Caucasian. 
He reacted so badly to the sun that the pediatrician had warned moving from the Pacific Northwest to Hawaii was a health risk. But by then, Lindsay's decision had been made. Thank you for listening to this clip, provided to you by Macmillan Audio. To hear more, look for this title wherever audiobooks are sold.